Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the North American Invasive Species Management Association webinar series. Um, today is Wednesday, October 16th, and today we have Dave Coyle from Clemson University, who will be talking about invasive species in North America. Um, Dr. Coyle is an assistant professor uh, in the forest health and of, in for, of forest health and invasive species um, in the forestry and environmental conservation department at Clemson University. Prior to Clemson, Dave created and directed the Southern Forest Health and Invasive Species Program, which provided education and training to forestry professionals across the southeastern U.S. Um, Dr. Coyle uses various forms of communication, including social media writing and in-person trainings to educate people about forest health, invasive species, and forest management. Um, Dave is a member of the Society of American Foresters and the Entomological Society of America and is the president of the North American Invasive Species Management Association Board of Directors for um, this current year, um, or actually uh, 2020. Um, he was just elected and we are thrilled to have him today um, and so again today, David will talk about invasive species in North America, and I'll turn it over to Dave in just a second. One couple, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, if you have questions, there is a box on your control panel that says questions. Please go ahead and type there, and at the end, we'll go through, um, and I will announce the questions, and Dave will answer them in the order that they were presented. Uh, you can also, you're also welcome to chat in the box at the bottom of the dialogue box there. Um, any sort of, any comments or um, non-questions you'd like to pose there, more than welcome. All right, so with that, let's uh, turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Bill. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, appreciate the introduction. And so here we are. So again, my name is Dave Coyle and I wanna give you an update today on some of the invasive species in North America. So we'll try to cover some of the insects, fungi and plants that, uh, that are present on this continent. I hope it's obvious to people that we are not going to get to all of them because we would be here all day. So we'll highlight a few of the uh, more important ones and then briefly touch on some of the other ones. So with that, let's get into it. But first, I always like to tell people there's a little bit of a disclaimer here and I'm gonna give you a lot of fact-based information, but I'm also gonna talk a little bit about some things I've seen uh, and some things I have observed and how that might relate to these invasive species and how we got to this state. So I always give this little disclaimer that you will get my opinion on occasions and I'll make it known when that is happening. The first thing to realize with invasive species is this is all driven, mostly driven by our economy. So last year we imported over $3.1 trillion in goods in 2018. And this map we're seeing here is just for the United States. Uh, it shows the places we trade with most commonly and how much we trade with them. So the thicker the arrow, the more stuff is moving. If it's a green arrow, we're sending stuff out. So we send a lot of stuff to Canada and Mexico. And if it's a red arrow, it means a lot of stuff in, a lot of stuff comes in, which means if you see this great big red arrow coming from China, China is our number one trade partner by a, by a country mile. We have an enormous amount of trade that comes in from China every day. And this is important because if we look at the world's vegetation zones, and we say this because a lot of these invasive species we have are of, uh, they originate on the, the continent of Asia. We've got emerald ash borer, we've got Japanese this, Chinese that, Asian that. It's because there's so much trade coming in, but also if we look at the world vegetation zones, a few things jump out. If you look at the southeastern US and southeastern China, you see the same color. That means there's the same type of forest there. In the southeast, we have a lot of pine, we have a lot of oak. Southeastern China, they have a lot of pine, they have a lot of oak. And if you work your way up the east coast, same thing. You've got the same type of forest as you move farther north. Even getting across uh, the country to the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia, you've got the same type of uh, forest as you have in parts of China, but also Europe. 
California has a very dry Mediterranean climate. Not shockingly, that's exactly what it is like around the Mediterranean Sea. And even up here in Canada, we'll talk about some, some Canadian things. Nova Scotia's got a couple of interesting issues. They've got a similar climate to much of Northern uh, Eurasia. So because of this, we have a lot of stuff coming in. And when one of these insects or pathogens gets here, it finds itself in a new land without a lot of natural enemies, but with a lot of the same environment it had uh, growing up. So what is an invasive species? There's a few things to talk about uh, here. First of all, anything that has been introduced uh, is non-native or exotic. So an invasive is, is introduced, it aggressively competes with and displaces native species, and it does not have natural enemies. Now we have a lot of non-native species here that are not invasive. We'll talk about some of those as the ambrosia beetles later. Invasive species have these three characteristics and this is called the invasion curve. This is pretty common in our field. And what it shows is as you have the area infested along the y-axis over on the left-hand side, and then you've got your time, the longer the time goes, the more you go to the right, at some point, you've got this introduction. You've got this one insect or pest or group of pests that get in here. As time goes, their uh, populations increase. And we don't always detect them right away, which is part of the problem. And emerald ash borer is a great case study right there. We found emerald ash borer in 2002, but after a bunch of research happened, we discovered it had actually been here since about probably 1997 five years when it was there and we did not know it was there. Uh, as this curve goes up and turns into the more yellow, this is when the public awareness typically begins. This is when we start seeing a lot of mortality or, or something you know, taking over. Uh, and at that point, you're probably not gonna eradicate that pest, you're just looking at controlling it on a local level. And how do they get here? Well, the most common way is gonna be on cargo. These great big containers are full of, these great big ships, excuse me, are full of these containers. Inside those containers is any number of types of commodities and crops. Uh, and you look at some of these ports we have in North America, they are just huge. Thousands of cargo ships, uh, thousands of containers coming in every single day. They come in on different things. Wood pallets uh, get a lot of the blame, but they're certainly not the only thing. Live plants are a really big pathway for invasive species because a lot of these live plants come from other countries. Uh, in some cases, a plant, uh, especially a woody plant, only needs to be a half an inch in diameter, about a centimeter in diameter. And that's big enough for some of these uh, invasive species to burrow in there, survive the trip across the pond, and then they get into North America. And once they're here, we are our own worst enemy. We have heard a lot of information in the last few years about insects moving in firewood. So yes, they do move in firewood. Pine straw in the southeastern United States. Now, if you've not heard of this, this is nothing more than dead pine needles that we bale up and we use it as a mulch. It sounds crazy to some, but it is super common and super useful here in this part of the world. But if not baled correctly, you can see in this picture, there's some green Japanese climbing fern, which is a really bad invasive species we have uh, down by the coast, uh, the coastal plain. And also just hitchhikers. This is a picture of the underside of a wagon a trailer that was going to go from Indiana to Florida. I think this gentleman was gonna pull this to his mother's house in Florida and didn't even realize that there were gypsy moth egg masses and adults underneath that trailer. And if not for just a, a fortunate chain of events uh, where he got stopped and a DNR person was there, they would not have found those and those would have been moved uh, across the country. Which brings us to our first insect we'll talk about, the emerald ash borer. This is a native to Asia. Here's your classic picture of Toledo, Ohio Street, Ashline Street in 2006 before emerald ash borer got there. Everything is green, it is beautiful. Just three years later, you've got every single one of those trees dead. How much damage has the AB done in this uh, continent? It is tough to tell because it's just so hard to get some of those figures. Our best guess is it has killed millions of trees and it has cost billions of dollars. I, I don't think that is any type of stretch to what it's actually done. Here's the most current map I, uh, we have out here. You can see most of Eastern North America has emerald ash borer in it to some extent. Some, some of these places, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, this 
this is old news. EAB has been there for quite some time and has decimated a lot of the ash populations. There's parts of the Southeast, parts of the Great Plains and parts of Canada where EAB is not there yet. So you still have a chance to do some preventative actions. Again, this is one where we will never eradicate emerald ash borer, but we can prepare ourselves for it to come because it more than likely will. Uh, they mate, they do a little bit of foliar feeding. So the adults do feed on the leaves, but that does negligible damage to the trees, almost no damage at all. The little eggs hatch in one to two weeks, and then you get these flat-headed wood boring larvae. Now, these are the things that do all the damage. You can see in this middle picture, they create these winding galleries. They chew through the phloem, cutting off that conductive tissue of the tree, and basically the tree starves to death. And in the end, they pack the galleries full of frass. Frass is nothing more than a fancy entomology term for poop. So they eat on one end of their bodies and they poop out the other and pack it behind them. Uh, they pupate over winter and then they emerge again the next spring, creating those D-shaped exit holes. So how do we know if we have emerald ash borer? Well, there's a few things we can look for. So they always attack trees in the genus Fraxinus. Now there is some evidence they might attack uh, a couple other types, but by and large, they are attacking ash trees, so Fraxinus species. First thing that's gonna be noticed is a declining or thinning crown, like you see here in this picture. Uh, this can be difficult to diagnose because in some cases, construction damage can make a tree look like this or a bad drought can make a tree look like this. One other thing that happens later is you get the tree dies except at the base, you get these epicormic sprouts. This is nothing more than this tree's last gasp effort for life. Uh, if you have an ash tree that looks like this, the odds are it can be fixed with one pruning cut parallel to the ground. Uh, you just cut it off and at this point it's probably time to plant something else and start over. When you look closely at that tree you can see those cracked barks. You'll see these cracked bark cracks in the bark and if you look real close in there you can often see the galleries winding back and forth and back and forth. You'll see again the D-shaped exit hole. So here's a, here's a finger right next to it. It's that perfect D-shape every time. And again, there's those winding galleries underneath. If you're driving by on the road from a distance, you might see what looks like, uh, we call it ash blonding. And this is where woodpeckers have come in and tried to peck away at the bark to find those larvae underneath there. Woodpeckers are very good at knowing where there are larvae to eat in a tree. And they go and flake off that outer half of ash bark, leaving that white uh, appearance underneath it. And speaking of woodpeckers, they also make holes, but you'll notice a woodpecker hole is not nearly as neat and tidy as a D-shaped exit hole from the emerald ash borer. If any of you have ever seen a woodpecker at work, that should be no surprise. They are not the, the cleanest uh, hole makers in the world, so it makes it fairly easy to distinguish their holes from the D-shaped exit holes. Now, how do we manage emerald ash borer? It's, it's tricky and clearly some things work and some do not. We monitor, there's a lot of monitoring that takes place, uh, still trapping to figure out where the emerald ash borer is, where it's going. A big part of what we do is outreach to try to get people to not move that firewood around. Emerald ash borer is one of those where it can be easily moved in firewood, especially over winter when the, the adults are, well, when the insects are pupating inside that wood, they can be moved, then they will emerge the next spring and potentially start a new, uh, new infestation. One other thing that's getting a lot of steam and having a lot of, uh, a lot of use lately is also biocontrol. There's a number of small, teeny tiny little wasps that can be uh, released and those will help keep the populations somewhat in check. They'll never eradicate it, but they will help keep the populations down a little bit. Now, dead and dying ash branches are very brittle and emerald ash borer is gonna kill just about every ash tree it comes in contact with. Every now and again, you get what we call a survivor tree, but by and large, if you have not treated an ash tree and emerald ash borer comes through, it's going to kill that tree. Uh, again, they become brittle within just a few weeks or a few months. These branches will sort of snap off like toothpicks, especially when you're in areas like this in a park in an urban area along a street, it can be a real hazard for people. Now that said, we can protect ash trees quite well at this point. There's a number of chemical uh, treatments that are very effective. 
Start these preventative treatments when EAB is 15 miles in the US. If you're in uh, Canada, you could say 24 kilometers. Start when they're about that far away. And that should give you enough time to get chemical into that tree and keep it protected from these insects. And I'm not gonna go into all the different insecticide treatments, but if you Google EAB chemical control, this publication will pop up. It is what we call the EAB chemical, well, I call it sort of the, the holy grail of what we know. Uh, this is the third edition of this book. It's got the latest and it's got the greatest uh, of all sorts of tree treatment options. So EAB is here to stay, but it is not, does no longer have to be a death sentence for your tree. You can 100% save a tree from EAB. Now let's talk real quickly about bark beetles. Most bark beetles in North America are native. Um, almost all of them are. Most of them attack stressed trees. Now, yes, there are exceptions. The mountain pine beetle in the western North America and the southern pine beetle in eastern North America are exceptions. Now, these two species are in the same genus. They're both in the Dendroctinus genus, and they are fully capable of killing healthy live trees. Again, those are exceptions. Most of the bark beetles we have are going to attack stressed trees. They also feed on phloem. Think of phloem again, it's the sleeve of life on a tree. It's that bunch of tissue right on the outside, kind of right underneath the bark. The feeding is gonna consume that phloem and then those trees die from lack of nutrition. And I'm telling you this because most, many people lump bark and ambrosia beetles together, but they are quite, quite different. Ambrosia beetles, there's many different kinds of these. Again, most of North America are native, but we do have quite a few non-native ambrosia beetles in North America. Most of these attack stress trees as well. So you're seeing a theme here. If you have a stress tree, it's gonna be susceptible to a lot of different things. These stress trees for ambrosia beetles can be pretty much anywhere. Natural areas, nurseries, urban environments. Uh, wherever there's a stress tree, those ambrosia beetles can find it because they're queuing in on volatiles that tree is giving off. Ambrosia beetles produce what we call toothpicks. So you see these on the left-hand side where you've got a little noodle or a toothpick sticking out of that tree. The beetles bore into that tree and what gets pushed out is sawdust and uh, frass and sometimes fungal mycelia. Because if you look in the middle, you've got a beetle that's gone in there. Now the bark beetles again are boring in, feeding on that phloem. The ambrosia beetles are simply boring in to make a house. So they bore in, make a gallery. They've got these uh, structures on their outside of their bodies that carry fungal spores. Fungal spores get on the inside of that gallery and they start growing. So that's why in this middle photo, you see dark, uh, dark whitish, uh, grayish whitish stuff inside that gallery that is the fungus growing. Uh, the beetles then lay their eggs and the larvae feed on the fungus. So they're not even eating the tree, they're just using it as a, as a place to have a home. And you can see a little ambrosia beetle on the tip of the finger on that last picture. So they're quite small. This is important because there is one ambrosia beetle in particular, the red bay ambrosia beetle, that is very important to the southeastern US and possibly more. Uh, again, we talked about them being small. This one is not much larger than a sprinkle on a donut. So we're talking a very small thing. And there's all sorts of these ambrosia beetles that are all roughly the same size. This makes detection difficult. And this sort of helps us figure how much the folks at the, at the customs and the ports are really working to try to find these things. It's a difficult job because there's so much stuff to perpetually go through. But we've got these ambrosia beetles, again, red bay ambrosia beetle being one of the worst ones. And ambrosia beetles are a good group to look at how these invasion dynamics work. So this is a study we did a few years ago down here in South Carolina. We caught all these species, almost 50 species. And if we look at the number of species, over three quarters of them were native, native ambrosia beetle species. That sounds great, right? But if we looked at the actual number of insects, it was pretty much opposite. So what you find in a lot of cases when you're dealing with an invasive species or invasive species in general, is you find a few individual species having a whole bunch of the total population. So in this case, you had just a few non-native uh, invasive species of ambrosia beetles dominating the entire ambrosia beetle fauna. Not uncommon for invasives in general. So let's talk about the red bay ambrosia beetle. The fungus it carries with it is called laurel wilt. This one, again, based on our estimates, has been responsible for up to 500 million trees killed in the southeast. 
This beetle has a very standard ambrosia beetle life cycle. The adult will attack a tree, drill in there, uh, create these galleries. The fungal spores from the body of the insect will start growing on the inside of that tree. You see all those toothpicks in the middle. Again, every toothpick is where one adult has drilled in there. On the upper right, you see larvae feeding on the dark fungus inside those galleries. And in this case, that fungus grows through the uh, conductive tissues of that tree and you get this fungal staining. Laurel wilt is very uh, detrimental in this part of the world because it attacks and kills everything in the family Lauraceae. So in the southeast we have bay trees, red bay swamp bay, silk bay, camphor tree. There's also sassafras which grows all the way up into the central hardwoods portion of the uh, of North America, pond spice bay laurel. And one thing we don't have on here is avocado. So it's pretty much decimated the Florida avocado industry. And I know my colleagues in California are sort of nervously watching this in hopes that it does not make it to California as well. Mexico has a huge Calif uh, avocado industry and that's a big concern to a lot of people that it could find its way down there eventually. This is what a red bay tree looks like when it's dead in the woods. It just sort of holds those dead leaves. So you get these uh, you know, ghosts just kind of hanging out in there. Red Bay is mostly an understory tree in this part of the world, but it's a very important understory tree to a lot of, uh, a lot of other animals. Our most current map of, of Laurel Wilt shows that it is fully uh, established in much of the Southeast. And it's recently, I won't say made the jump, we recently found it in Kentucky and Tennessee. Now I have a hunch, and these were in Sassafras up in Kentucky and ten Tennessee. I have a hunch that we'll see a lot of these counties between Kentucky and Tennessee and the coastal plain get filled in in the next few months here or, or next couple of years. But one thing to notice is you see it's already established in several counties in eastern Texas, okay? And this was done in 2015, 2016. So it's been there for a while. This is a map that some colleagues made back in 2008. And they modeled how fast would laurel wilt spread if people had nothing to do with it. And so they looked at how fast the beetle goes, where the hosts were. Their predictions for Eastern Texas was 2040. Now, if we go back to this slide, you can see it is not 2040 and it is already firmly established in Louisiana, Eastern Texas and Arkansas. Here's a classic example of how people have moved this thing faster than it would have on its own. And people are responsible for the rapid advancement of this uh, particular disease. It's very unfortunate because people move firewood kind of all over the place. Here's a shot from the Everglades, um, looking at the, all the dead swamp bays in that part of the world. It's tricky for managing laurel wilt. Um, I don't have a lot of good news here. You can't physically protect the tree. That just simply doesn't work. Insecticides work, yes, but in most of the places we have laurel wilt, these beetles are flying year round and you have to hit the beetles when they're on the outside of the tree before they bore in. Uh, so that's not really feasible. Fungicides, hey, they work, there's the good news. Uh, the bad news is they're not cheap and they need to be reapplied annually. So what we often recommend people is if you've got a, a yard tree, something in your front yard, the pride and joy, or your grandpa helped you plant it, you can keep it alive, but it will cost you. In the end, sanitation is one of the best things we can do. You can take that infested material and you can chip it up very small and then that will help kill the beetles. So laurel wilt is a bad one. We're watching it very closely uh, and hope to keep it out of you know, other parts of the continent so far. Now, another one of these scolotine beetles, we've got this invasive shot hole borer complex, this Ualacea species complex. These are also native to Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands, and they're a potentially major pest of many different types of trees. Here's another one that will attack and kill healthy and stressed trees. And so far, you can see the host list includes over 400 species and 75 families. That's most of everything we have woody in this part of the world. So there's a couple groups here. We've got these T-shot hole borers. These are found in both Florida and California back in a few years ago here in 2012. And these are gonna really hit avocado, citrus, and many of these other street trees. And they have a fungi with them that causes tree dieback. You can see that picture down here in the corner. Uh, we also have these, what we call the shot hole borers, the Polyphaga shot hole borer and the Kuroshio shot hole borer. 
These so far are only in Southern California. We found them in 2003 and they kill avocado and many, many landscape trees. So uh, these are a problem, especially in the Western part of the continent here. What to look for? Well, you see several things. You see these little exit, exit and entrance holes entrance holes mostly you've got this uh, resin flowing down we call it gummosis you might have frass or sawdust coming again those beetles are boring into that tree and kicking all that stuff out because they're just trying to make a home and then if you scrape away a little bit of that bark you're going to see fungal staining it might be red it might be brown it kind of depends on what type of tree uh, has been impacted the hub of information on these these critters is over there at uh, in the University of California system. Uh, here is a website if you have more questions, ucanr.edu slash site slash PSHB. Our next one is the spotted lanternfly. This is our most recent invasive. It's gotten a lot of attention, potentially major pests of fruit trees and vines, and it was first found in Pennsylvania a few years ago. Here's a couple of spotted lanternflies, both crawling on a branch, and this one is on the tip of my finger. So you can see it as a large insect. It's about, uh, you know, one half to three quarters of an inch long. Uh, it's very bright, very obvious looking. Here they are on the side of a tree. You've got an adult right next to a brightly colored red, white, and black nymph. These are like they're a type of, uh, of, of plant hopper, more or less, and they stick their mouth parts into that tree the fluid from the tree goes through them and they basically poop out this sugar water. So everything below them gets covered in a wet sticky substance. Uh, it, it's sticky, it's shiny, and then this dark fungus grows on it. So it's called sooty mold. So everywhere underneath a heavy infestation of these things, you will find this black sooty mold. If that's not gross enough, the numbers alone can be just amazing how many of these things can be caught on one tree and on you know any of these things in your in the urban areas especially the life cycle goes from an egg mass and again these are like a type of plant hopper so you've got uh, no you've got incomplete metamorphosis so the little ones just kind of get bigger and bigger and bigger they develop a red color just before they become adults and then as adults they develop their wings the egg mass is one of the most interesting life stages of them because it, it's extremely hard to find. They like to lay these on pretty much anything. You can see a couple of them right here on this piece of rock. Uh, I've often said it looks kind of like dry silly putty that's just been stuck on there. It can be incredibly hard to find and it's easy to spread this thing around just because they lay their eggs on pretty much anything. In the foreground here, you see some dead grape vines. Uh, in Pennsylvania, This the grape industry has been hit really, really hard, uh, but that's not the only thing we're looking at. There's over 70 reported hosts so far, most of which are woody things. And this includes trees. This could be your walnut trees, your maple trees, your birch trees. Uh, from what we know so far, conifers do not appear to be hosts, but they can be used as transports, including Christmas trees. And we mentioned earlier, these things will lay their eggs on pretty much anything and they will crawl on pretty much anything. They have a strong preference for tree of heaven, which uh, you may know is also an invasive species. I would caution you don't get too excited. They're not going to wipe out tree of heaven because there's simply too many of them. But knowing this, it might be a way that we could use that against them if they need tree of heaven to develop. Uh, some have taken to injecting insecticide in tree of heaven. You see that in this picture on the right, which will then kill all the insects on that tree. So far, where is spotted lanternfly? It is mostly in Pennsylvania and neighboring states. There is one little uh, infestation there in the tip of Virginia. As of yesterday, uh, Connecticut has another live adult find. Um, you see that noted by that green star right there. And because I care and want the most recent information for you folks, as of about an hour ago, I spotted this. Uh, we found dead spotted lanternflies in California airports. Uh, you'll notice that was from today, and I'll blow this up for you. A total of, they've reported to date, a total of 11 dead spotted lanternflies arriving on cargo planes in California airports. So this thing moves around quite a bit. It gets everywhere, it crawls everywhere. It doesn't fly particularly well, but it is, it is a good jumper and it will jump and, and sort of half fly, half glide. 
and it can get into a lot of stuff and it is getting moved around. And when we talk about that, how much, you know, what is at risk? And this is a recent uh, study that came out not too long ago. What is the potential distribution for spotted lanternfly in the US? And you can see much of the Eastern continent. Now I know this map stopped with, with the US, but let's be honest here. A lot of the Eastern part of North America is susceptible to spotted lanternfly, as is the extreme Western part. Uh, basically, your Rocky Mountains don't have a, a high risk, but it is there are some areas where there's a low suitability, but you've got a pretty good chance. Um, I shouldn't say a pretty good chance. There's a, if it gets there, it's got a good chance of establishing because it's got uh, very favorable conditions in a lot of parts of this continent. This is where I direct people to go for all the latest on spotted lanternfly. This is the Penn State Extension Program. They've got a very, very good spotted lanternfly program. There's your website. Uh, Pennsylvania being ground zero for this insect has sort of got a whole bunch of really, really good information on control methods, insecticides that work, everything to do with spotted lanternfly. I advise folks to go right to Penn State. Another insect that we're finding move across the southern and eastern part of the U.S. is the crepe myrtle bark scale. So crepe myrtles are a very common ornamental plant. Uh, it's not a tree, it's more of a shrub. It's very common in uh, the southern and eastern U.S. This scale is native to Asia. And again, we just talked about sooty molds. So scales function in the same way as lantern flies in that they stick their feeding part into that plant. The fluids come through them and they poop out sugar water. So that sugar water drips over everything, gets wet, mold grows on it, and then you've got sort of a disgusting uh, sooty mold issue going. Crate myrtle bark scale looks like a little white scale. You can see in the bottom middle here, you've got these white scales all over. And one real good diagnostic for crate myrtle bark scale is that if you squish it, it squishes pink. It's got pink guts, bright pink guts. So that's something that's very diagnostic for crate myrtle bark scale. And it does have an impact. You know, some will say that this is just an aesthetic thing and, you know, it only matters to, to people who really care about the look. But here's a really good picture of a side-by-side -side treatment from uh, Arkansas, I believe, or it could have been Oklahoma. This was, the, the crate myrtle on the left was treated with dinotefuran to reduce the crate myrtle bark scales. The one on the right was not. These were the same uh, size, more or less. You can see how many more blooms and how much fuller the blooms are on that treated tree compared to that untreated tree. So while crepe myrtle bark scale might not kill the crepe myrtles, it definitely can negatively impact how they look. And in a lot of places where a crepe myrtle is, that's important because crepe myrtles are planted because they look good and because people want stuff to look good where they are. Here's our current distribution. You can see it's spotty. I suspect there's more of it here than we actually see. We very recently found this thing in the Columbia area in the Charlotte Rock Hill area of North Carolina. Also, I believe in, uh, I thought it was in Nashville, they might've also um, had a spot too. So we're seeing crate myrtle bark scale uh, become found in a few more places now. What do you do to manage crepe myrtle bark scale? Well, the easiest thing is avoid purchasing infested plants. So if you're going to buy one of these crepe myrtles, look it over and make sure there's nothing on there right away. Scales don't hop. So they, they once they fasten onto a plant, they're there for the duration of their lives. They lay eggs. There's one stage where they call them crawlers. Well, they will move, but they generally move just on that plant. So you can find the insects on that plant. Uh, diverse plantings, and if you have an infested plant, eliminate it, get rid of it. There's not a lot of natural enemies that, that hit these critters, so you do have to, often will have to use some sort of insecticide or horticultural oil. It needs to be timed quite well to actually work. There's also soil applied systemic insecticides, and uh, again, the, the person that I go to, the go-to man for crepe myrtle bark scale in this country, in my opinion, in this continent is Urfan Bifei at the Texas A&M Overton Station. I have his contact there. He is one of the people that has done the most work on this critter. He probably knows the most about it of anyone. And if I ever have questions about it, he is the guy I call. So 
in a similar life stage in feed, feeding form, we have the hemlock woolly adelgid. Now, this one is much more uh, prevalent than just the southeastern U.S. This is from Japan. You've got a couple generations a year. It's only females. It's a really interesting uh, type of insect. The population growth can be very rapid. You can see this white uh, appearance on all these branches. We'll see a closer picture, but it almost looks like each one looks like it's in a little teeny cotton ball that sits on top of that, that hemlock branch. Here's your life cycle. The main things to look at is that over winter, a lot of the feeding happens. And this is one of those unique insects that kind of goes dormant over the summer. So there's a crawler stage, but then they just kind of hang out for a while, do most of their feeding when it's cooler. Here's a very close up of this insect. And you can see this long thing coming out from the bottom of it. That's actually the mouth part. So that's the thing that it sticks way down into the tree. It settles right at the base of a needle. So at the base of this needle, you can see a little black thing surrounded in white. That is the adelgid and it has got that stylet. We call it the mouth part is stylet, goes way deep down into there, tapping into those uh, resources. Here are those little tiny cotton balls I mentioned. You can see some of the black things inside there. That's the adelgid. These adelgids will cause, you know, they drain the fluids of this tree. The foliage grays, the canopy thins, the branches die, and eventually the tree dies. And this is important because a healthy hemlock forest looks like this. Hemlock is a, is a, is a, a climax species. It provides all sorts of habitat and benefits to all manners of life below it. And when you have a hemli, hemlock woolly adelgid infestation, then it looks like this. You've just got this death and mortality, and it can completely change uh, the ecosystem all around it. Our current distribution in 2017, this is where we knew HWA. It was mostly in the eastern part, the Appalachian type range, but it's also up in, in Canada. And as of 2019, it was found right there, kind of across the across the river from New York. So there's a couple spots in Canada. And you'll notice there's a lot of uh, green here that's not infested yet, that does not have yellow or brown in it. This is all the native range of hemlock. So there's still a lot of the hemlock's range that has not been affected. And we're trying hard to make sure it does not get affected. Management for HWA, again, is tricky because a lot of these things, uh, you know, they they occur in natural areas. So you're not gonna go do a lot of chemical treatments in natural areas. If you've got one of these trees that is uh, in, a, in an urban environment or a park environment, there's a number of things you can do. You can do horticultural oils, biocontrols work fairly well in some cases. Um, again, sometimes chemical treatments work okay, but in some cases you do nothing because it's, it's the most uh, prudent thing to do. So it all depends on where the pest is and where that particular tree is. Now, are there other invasive insects and fungi? Of course there are. So there's a whole list of them here, gypsy moth. I think most of us in Eastern North America are well aware of this one. Uh, it is firmly entrenched in Eastern North America. There's a program in the US called Slow the Spread. And this is basically a large government program that helps hold the line on where the infestations are. Uh, parts of the northeastern U.S. have the brown tail moth, which can be a big human uh, human health hazard because the hairs on the lar on the caterpillar can cause some very severe allergic reactions. Asian longhorn beetle has popped up in various parts of eastern uh, North America over the years. They just eradicated one of the spots in New York City. Uh, beech bark disease and chestnut blight are very uh, impactful fungal diseases responsible for a lot of mortality of different types, these beech and chestnut trees. Nova Scotia has got a couple of these uh, pests we're keeping an eye on, the beech leaf mining weevil and the brown spruce longhorn beetle. And out west, uh, Western North America, you're not free. You've got sudden oak death among a whole number of other things as well. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, insect wise and fungal wise, we've gone over some of the main things. But there's a lot out there and there's always new stuff coming in. We're always watching, uh, trying to figure out what is going to be the next thing that we need to deal with. But let's move on to a few plants now. So just a couple. We'll start with Kogon grass. This is one of the world's worst noxious weeds. It infects nearly 500 million acres worldwide. It's native to Asia, but it's now everywhere but Antarctica. 
It was first uh, brought to the southeastern U.S. in the early 1900s as uh, we thought it would be a good forage for livestock. Uh, it turns out it's got a very high silica content, which means animals do not want to eat it. It's something you think they would have checked on before they brought it over, but uh, hindsight being 2020, that's where we are. And here's what a beautiful field of kogan grass looks like. It has a very light green color to me. This picture was in Florida. Uh, it flowers in the spring to early summer. It's got sort of white puffy seed heads on it. It's got this off-centered white midrib. And if you run your fingers up that, uh, up that leaf, it's very, very scratchy. That's that silica content, which is also why the animals don't really care to eat it. Underneath the ground, it has a very dense mat of rhizomes. I mean, we're talking extremely, extremely dense. And one of the main things about those is you get these pointed ones. Now, these are sharp enough where I have seen uh, folks in Florida was growing, were growing this plant in plastic kiddie pools that you might buy a, a $15 kiddie pool in the summer, let the kids splash around in. They had kogan grass growing in these pools, and I have seen these pointed rhizomes stab their way through the side of a plastic kiddie pool. So they are extremely sharp. Um, and also those roots are segmented. So one of those roots, uh, one of those root segments can turn into a new plant. This becomes a problem on fire lines and in harvesting operations where we might have equipment that has the metal tracks on it. Dirt often gets caught up, clods of dirt get caught in those metal tracks and it's very easy for a little chunk of root to be in one of those pieces of dirt, get caught in the track get transported to the next place where they're doing the next fire line or the next harvest, and then a new population can come from there. The biology of kogan grass, it's more or less the perfect weed. So it forms very large monocultures where nothing else can grow inside there. It is successful in low light or high light. It is uh, fire adapted, so it really likes being burned. It also grows in such a way that it promotes fire. So as it grows up, Anytime a leaf from kogan grass dies, it stays standing. So in a field, like you see on that top picture, probably a third to a half of those things are just dry, dead blades of grass standing straight up. This means that when a fire gets going in there, that fire carries up and it becomes extremely hot and extremely uh, dangerous very quickly. Um, in the southeastern U.S., we've got several tree species, pines especially, that are adapted to fire. They have been adapted to grow and have a fire go right over them. But unfortunately, if kogan grass is present, it can make that fire so hot that it actually kills the fire-adapted trees. So it's a, it's a really unfortunate situation. It's also drought tolerant. And for that, for that matter, it's almost flood tolerant. It is extremely hard to kill kogan grass. Now, it can be done. It takes multiple years of... Uh, intense treatment, either chemical or cultural, but it can be done. And one other plant I'm going to talk about, there, we could talk about plants all day. You know, there's, there's privet across much of the eastern U.S., there's honeysuckle, there's cheatgrass out west, there's all sorts of different plants. Obviously, we can't cover them all, but I want to talk about cattle repair for just a minute because this, in my opinion, uh, remember the dude, you're going to get opinions. This, to me, is going to be the next big invasive species in the in the United States. I think it's already well on its way there. So calorie repair is also known as Bradford pear. So it's Pyrus calariana, native to China. Uh, deciduous grows very quickly, it fruits early, widely planted as an ornamental. And now you see there's sterile varieties grafted on fertile rootstock. Uh, seed is spread by birds and other animals and roots sprout from dense thickets. Now, if you've never seen a Bradford pear, this is what it looks like, uh, planted, again, planted over much of the southeast and the eastern U.S. Yes, it can be very pretty every spring. It's one of the first things to flower. You get these great big white puff balls, but it also has one heck of an odor, once described like rotting fish and semen. That is from Business Insider. Anyone who has been around a bunch of flowering Bradford pears has its own uh, descriptor of how it smells. I've heard rotten peanut butter, I've heard old gym socks, uh, I've heard just death in general. It's got a pungent smell. Now that said, again this is native to Asia and it's resistant to fire blight and this is why it was brought to this country in the first place around 1900. We had planted Eurasian pears over here as part of the, uh, or European pears, excuse me, as part of our pear, you know, pear production. 
fire blight came in. This is a disease that causes branch tips uh, to die and it causes um, the fruit to fall off, spread by pollinators. So we have this disease, but we knew this uh, Pyrus calorianum was resistant to fire blight. So we needed some of these specimens to try to figure out if we could use it. They sent this guy, Frank Meyer, over to Asia. He collected a whole bunch of these things, brought them back, and they were able to use that with the European pear to halt fire blight. So they grafted the European pears onto the Pyrus calorianum rootstock, and ta-da, it worked. It saved the pear industry, which is awesome. Uh, again, they did this by grafting. So you've got a scion from an edible pear, and you've got the calorie pear rootstock. But then, of course, several, they planted a bunch of these things that, uh, in Maryland because they had a bunch over and they planted them to try to use them in this way. Um, this fella, John Creech, was in charge and he noticed that some of these selections had some horticultural value. They were disease resistant, drought resistant, pollution resistant, and he picked one in particular because it had all these things. It was thornless and he named it Bradford after the station director. So this is how the Bradford pair got here so it's his fault. Everything we say from here on is going to be this guy's fault. This is how Bradford pear came to be. Again, Bradford pear was made the same way as we as we got uh, as we combated the fire blight. We take a scion from that Bradford pear, that thornless shoot, and then you have a rootstock of P. calorianum, but it could be any genetics, right? Well. They grew a bunch of these. They sold a, a, quite a few of them in the horde industry, and they knew that around 25 to 30 years old, these things started breaking. Uh, I've heard some arborists describe what they grow as as a suicidal branch structure. It looks like you've got a, a five, six foot stem, and then all the branches just go straight up. Very weak branch, branch angles. They break off with wind. They break off with ice. They might even break off with a heavy rain, or if you look at them funny. Uh, they also noticed that now, when you have only Bradford pears around, they cannot, they're, they're incompatible with each other. So if you've got a row of Bradford pears growing, they are not gonna make a seed. But if there's Bradford pear in any other pyrus, it could be one of the European pears, it could be a root sprout from the, the pyrus caloriana that the Bradford pear is on top of, then that could make a seed. So they knew that it wasn't entirely seedless as they promoted it. Uh, their response was, well, sorry. And I, you know, I think I read at one point, Creech uh, basically said the pros outweigh the cons in this type of thing. Because of that, because of their ability that they actually can make seed that's viable, we now have wild calorie pear growing practically everywhere. We see it all over in old fields. We see it along the roadsides. We see it in unsold lots in town, on the edge of town. And most importantly to, to me, especially, is we're seeing it grow into forests. So all this stuff in the understory is calorie pear growing inside one of our pine forests down here. Uh, those of you that, that work with calorie pear, you know this map is incredibly incomplete. Calorie pear is all over the place in the eastern part of the United States. And it's not just that it grows everywhere. It has these really vicious thorns. Uh, these are no joke. Uh, part of the problem here is that the thorns are strong enough to puncture rubber tires. So unless someone is going in there to do uh, forest management and silviculture with, with implements on tracks, on metal tracks, you are going to lose a lot of money fixing tires. And I talked to one fellow not too long ago. He was trying to clear a five-acre chunk of land, and he estimated he had lost $1,000 just fixing tires on various implements that he had used to try to get this stuff out of there. So I tell you all this because most of the invasive plants we have in North America were brought here on purpose, just like the calorie pear, just like kogan grass. Most of these things were brought in uh, because of their horticultural value. Um, so that's that's an unfortunate thing. Again, hindsight being 2020. Now, is there any hope, even a sliver, um, I was asked this earlier, yes, there always is hope. Um, one thing we can do to help give hope is promote native species if you're gonna plant those in your yard. Plant something native, get it from where you live, put something appropriate to the environment. Don't move around infected material. If you have a tree that died in your yard and there's insects in there, keep it there. Don't take it three states over to, to grandma's house for Thanksgiving bonfire. 
keep the wood where it needs to be. Don't move things around. Don't move plants around and, and buy the stuff local and use native species. With that, I am happy to take any questions and thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Thanks, Dave. That was an incredible amount of information. Um, we do have a few questions and we've got about 10 minutes. Um, if folks would like to stay, I'm gonna go through our list here um, in the question box on your control panel. And as we're going through these questions, if anyone else would like to post any, please do. So the first question is, can you elaborate on what the ash blonding looks like? Does it look like the bark has been sheared off? Yeah, the ash blonding, and I can elaborate this way. If you're driving by on, at 55 miles an hour, it looks like the tree trunk has been turned a mottled white color. And so what happens is the, the bark basically flakes off halfway through itself. So it's kind of the outer few layers flake off underneath there. So it's not flaking all the way to the stem or to the cambium. It's just kind of the outer half of the bark gets flecked off. Um, and it's usually not the entire tree. It's gonna be, like I said, uh, mottled or splotchy, but it's extremely obvious. Once you've seen it once, you can pick it out just like that anytime moving forward. So it, it's got a very different color, a very white, uh, pretty much white color compared to the rest of the bark. Super, thanks Dave. Um, next question is, does anyone have a link to the California airport article? Uh, they couldn't find it online. I don't know if Dave, if you. Oh, I um, thought I had, had it on that. I think it's, I think it's on that. Um, it's at the bottom of that slide. So I can yeah, dig I it can... up uh, and pass it out, but I, I put it on the bottom of that slide. I think that sounds right. Um, and on that note, uh, for folks who would like to have this recording after this webinar, it will be posted on um, the NASMA member password protected portal. Uh, so you do have to be a NASMA member, but it, it will, this presentation will be available uh, through that link. Uh, so uh, I'll give another plug for membership in the end here, but let's get through a couple more questions. Um, Brown-tailed moss is in Nova Scotia and um, looks like mm. Northeast New Brunswick, no, New Brunswick as well, but in low numbers so far. Good. I guess that's not a question. But <laughs> it's good to know though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next question, how do we convince our neighbors to cut down their invasives like Bradford and Mimosa? Oh man, if I knew the answer to this, I would already be a self-made millionaire and be on an island somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's it's tricky and this is the hardest part about invasive species is that you know it takes a village to accomplish a goal. And if you you can be the best land steward in the world and have a completely native invasive free property, but if your native has a whole row of Bradford pear or Chinese privet or Japanese honeysuckle planted it's not gonna matter because that stuff is always gonna come over. Uh, how to do that, you know, the best thing that I can advise is to try to not come at them antagonistically or, you know, why are you being an idiot? Cut that down. You've got to try to do two things. You've got to come at them kind, gentle, with information, and also, and I think this is super important, offer an alternative. Don't just tell someone to, and I just, this is what I think, you don't just tell someone to take out the Bradford pear in their front yard without giving them an option for something else to go in there. There's all sorts mm -hmm. of beautiful native trees that flower at the same time that would be great in that scenario. Offer one of those, or at least give them the option like, hey, you know, Bradford pear really contributes to all these negative things in the environment. Japanese uh, or, or, or um, Carolina silverbell, that looks kind of the same way. It's a tree with a bunch of white flowers. That would be really great right there. Um, it's tricky, you know, and it all depends on how well do you know your neighbor, right? If you guys, if you have a good relationship, then it's an easier topic to broach than if it's someone that, you know, you can't stand. Um, I wish I had a better answer, but it's one of those things that just takes tact and care and just consider what you're asking them to do. They may, there may be special meaning with that plant. You don't know what, you know, what their story is, or you may not know their story. Um, but I always just try to go in with as much information as I can and also 
an alternative or, or something to replace it with. And I'm not saying you have to buy it for them, but at least give them a starting point is where to find something else. You know, don't just say, you got to get this out of here. Say, it would be great if you could replace this with one of these uh, native things. That's a hard one. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, 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 I think it requires a conversation uh, and, you know, and kind of asking what is, what, what are the priorities of, of this person you're talking to? You know, are they, they're right. probably, if they enjoy plants, they're, they might be interested to know that that species is overtaking habitat for native, beautiful native species. And they may not have you know, realized that or, you know, threatening native wildlife. So, yeah. And, and that's another that's a good point, Bell. You know, calorie pear, especially, very few insects eat calorie pear. I mean, very, very few. That's why it's so successful. So one way to come at calorie, especially, is that compared to like a native cherry tree, that tree is providing zero in the way of food for wild birds, right? Any wild bird that needs to eat a caterpillar is, or feed caterpillar to their young in their nest, you're not going to get it from a calorie pear. They're going to get it from something native. So calorie pair, in essence, are taking up space where natives could be, and they're preventing natives from producing food for birds. So like you said, it, it could take a, a conversation, or I would even say conversations, and sometimes it can take a lot of conversations over a lot of time. It's, it's playing the mm -hmm. long game at, at times. Um, and again, it all depends on you know, your specific situation, relationship, all that stuff. Yep. All right, I think we have time for one last question here. On the spotted lanternfly map, there were certain areas shown as unsuitable habitat. What makes these areas, such as here in Central Florida, unsuitable habitat? Could that change over time? From what I understand about, and I read that modeling paper, it was pretty, pretty high science-y, but I got through it. And I believe there's a, a temperature range where spotted lantern flies are adapted to. It is pretty much considered to be a little bit too warm uh, in, in the far south to be really suitable for spotted lantern flies. That's why. Um, now, Florida, especially, you've got plenty of other things to, to, to take the place of spotted lantern fly. Florida's kind of invasive species central, but uh, spotted lantern flies are very um, sort of bound by the temperature, which is why you saw that great big range of very suitable uh, area kind of right across the middle of the US where they, are, where, they, where they are now, basically, just kind of moving to the west there. So it's a combination of temperature and, um, and hosts. So that's kind of why you saw the host or the suitability drop off in the middle of the country. There's just not as many woody hosts out there that could be suitable for them. Uh, but from what I have read, most of that is temperature based. Great. Excellent. Well, on that note, um, that was the last question. So uh, we'll wrap this webinar up. I want to thank um, Dr. Dave Coyle again for providing this really incredibly comprehensive webinar today. Uh, and again, if you are interested in seeing this recorded webinar, it will be made available on NASMA's website for members. So if you are not a member, uh, go to nasma.org and click on join. Um, you can have access to not only this webinar, but all of our webinars um, in our uh, member portal area, uh, in addition to a variety of other member benefits. So um, do take advantage of that opportunity. And again, thanks, Dave, so much for this excellent webinar. Um, check out our website for future webinars. Our, the NASMA webinar series is held on the third Wednesday of every month. Uh, we are gearing up to, we're putting our schedule together for 2020, so we have still uh, two more left this year. Um, I, believe, um, I believe we have Terry Hogan from the Park Service talking next month about uh, how the National Park Service incorporates invasive species management. So on that, again, thank you, Dave, so much, and have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, everybody.